Hey everyone, what's up? Here's another episode of Find Your Film. It's been a while, possibly around... It's been over three weeks because I've been figuring out how to reconfigure Find Your Film since me, Bruce, and Eric have moved over to Cinematics for our weekly show where we do our weekly movie reviews. We're not doing that here anymore at Find Your Film. We're going to be focusing on DVD and Blu-ray coverage, and that is my bad. The last several weeks I've been mired in recent films to cover, but now that I have a spare moment... I'm going to actually finally upload Bruce Perky's review of Blu-ray review, by the way, Blu-ray review of a Japanese film called Cure. It was released in 1997. It's considered a classic, a great, great film. And for some reason, it's still under the radar here in the States or maybe around the world. I'm sure it's probably praised in Japan, but specifically here in the States, Cure is not really well known. It's celebrated. It's currently streaming on the Criterion channel as of this recording. And for Bruce, for this purposes, Bruce Perky has a Blu-ray review whether and tells you guys whether or not Cure is worth actually purchasing on Blu-ray if you have the cash, okay? Have the funds to purchase Cure. And spoiler alert, Bruce Perky really loves this movie. That's why he did the review of Cure. Also in this episode is an interview with Zach Golden. He is a director of a new film called High Heat. It was released a couple of weeks ago, and it is not on Blu-ray or DVD. It is not in theaters anymore, but it is available on digital and on demand. It stars Olga Kurlenko and Don Johnson, Caitlin Doubleday, Christian Mantopoulos, Diamond Dallas Page. I believe he goes by Dallas Page these days. Former wrestler. Really interesting, good film. It centers on a chef played by Olga Kurlenko. She opens up her new restaurant, it's a hit the first night. The problem is her husband, the, char- the ever-charming Don Johnson, owes a mob boss played by Dallas Page a lot of money. And what, what was going to happen? Well, I'm not going to really spoil what was going to happen, but he is in for a lot of money. And that is a, a big threat. His life is in danger. And most importantly, his wife's life is in danger. And maybe the safety of the restaurant is also in danger in high heat. High heat is sort of a double meaning. High heat meaning... The flame that goes to the meals that Olga Kurilenko's character cooks and prepares, etc., etc., and high heat is the predicament that both of them are in right now because Dallas Page is sending a bunch of cronies, mercenaries, henchmen to this restaurant to dispatch of the restaurant. But lo and behold, Olga Kurilenko's character is more than a chef. She is a one-person killing machine. Very interesting movie. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I recommend it, especially especially if you're a fan of Olga Kurilenko and Don Johnson. A very fun action comedy thing, thingamabob. And I also interviewed Caitlin Doubleday and Christy Mantopoulos. Those interviews can be found on my Cinematics podcast feed. So you can go over to Cinematics and listen to their interviews as well. But Zach's interview is really cool because I have always, since I'm a city kid, I barely, I've, I maybe I've gone in my life to what two to three hikes in my life. The fact that he lives in in the Catskills and I visited the Catskills back. I don't even know if you just call it Catskills or the Catskills. I visited it back when I was 13 or 14. And I remember the long drive from Queens, New York, where my aunt and uncle lived. It took It seemingly took forever. And when we got to the Catskills, I've, I'd never seen so many trees and and just nature in my life. So that was just a very big moment for me, even though here I am in L.A. Yeah, basically L.A., I'm a city kid, suburban kid. And the idea of any type of mountain or just flush of trees and wildlife and nature still to this day uh, is is pretty much foreign to me. So a big part, not a big part, a part of the interview with Zach has me asking him about what does he get as an as an actor, not as an actor, as a filmmaker just living in that area amidst all amidst mother nature does that help him as an artist and a filmmaker zach golden he was actually on board for high heat now it was it wasn't a project that he was developing for over a year or six months he had six weeks in pre-production he was late to the game and also what happens is he only had 15 days to actually make this movie for all that time constraints the movie turned out well i was surprised i wouldn't have blinked otherwise. I, I'm surprised that it, the production days were very short and the pre-production was very short because I ended up enjoying the film on IMDb, by the way, the rating is 4.6. Okay. 
I I would give it a seven to eight. I I love Kirilenko. I love Don Johnson. I love this movie. We also talk about his previous film, The Escape, uh, The Escape of Prisoner Six Fourteen, and that came out in two thousand eighteen. After watching High Heat, I definitely want to check out The Escape of Prisoner Six Fourteen, and I I allude to that film towards the end of the interview. He also mentions, as far as favorite movies, a movie called Tampopo. Now, Tampopo is a, I think it's a Japanese film, but both Tampopo and the aforementioned Cure are are available for streaming on the Criterion channel, okay? So even though I'm focusing on, for this Find Your Film podcast, to make it all about physical media and Blu-rays and DVDs, of course, streaming is very important, okay? So when you can, if you can actually watch Tampopo and also Cure, which is the way I'm going to see both of these movies, streaming options are, in my opinion, obviously the most convenient way of consuming your content but time and time again physical media once you look even though right now i just got a ps5 a couple days ago and thank goodness now i can play 4k discs so now i can play 4k dvd and blu-ray that said if i can still play if i can play 4k discs and blu-ray do i throw away my dvds and the answer to that question in my opinion if you have space is no because who knows Certain movies, there's so many streaming outlets out there that they're, I'm sure you're assuming, or at least I'm just assuming that everything is all under one big movie umbrella, and that's not the case. There are so many, I'm assuming there's thousands and thousands of movies that slip through the cracks, and maybe some of these movies may only be available, there, if not on digital or streaming, on a hard copy, on a, on a DVD. Another level is, I've traded, D, look... I've been collecting DVDs since the inception. It just pains me to see how many DVDs I've traded in for either cash or for other DVDs and realizing that the DVDs that I traded in for are either out of stock, they're not in print, or maybe they're marked up for $40 to $50 on Amazon and there's really no way to get them. So look, even though DVDs are obviously several generations worse than 4K, I think having physical media, no matter what shape they're in, I mean, even if it's something as low right now, quote unquote low as DVD, I think it's very important to have physical media as far as your personal archive, because there's going to become a time when the movie that you want to see won't be available on your streaming list. Okay. So maybe it's that situation's already happened to you. It's happened to me a couple of times already. There's this movie called Point Blank, which I purchased, not in purchase, I got the DVD from Warner Brothers Home Entertainment years back. I did the review and it was really cool. Love the movie. The movie's directed by John Borman. Anderson and I reviewed the film for our recent Patreon and the problem is I didn't have the DVD anymore. I had to rent it, which is fine, rent it on YouTube. But I couldn't, if you, if I really wanted to purchase this DVD, Point Blank, starring Lee Marvin, directed by John Borman, Amazon was listing it, I believe, for 40 bucks. A movie that I received years ago for free, or if I, now I was expecting, it would cost me at the most maybe $15, $16, but that disc is out of print. So keep, I'm just saying, keep your stuff if you can. <laughs> keep some of your DVDs and don't throw away as many. If you have the space, if you have the space and you, if you have the means, start holding on to those DVDs and Blu-rays. If you've gotten to this point of the long-winded intro, I am giving away three discs this for this episode. And the movies are, because I go to Do- the Dollar Tree Store a lot, so I haven't been there during this whole Christmas vacation, but I have three discs for people who listen to this Find Your Film podcast, okay? I have three Blu-rays. First Blu-ray is Mark Wahlberg in The Gambler, that movie The Gambler, Blu-ray and DVD. And I, I would look at the special features right now, but uh, my eyes are not, the the type is really bad, but I, w- I should bring a magnifying glass ne- next time. But anyways, The Gambler on Blu-ray and DVD, that movie also stars Brie Larson. I also have Same Kind of Different as Me, starring Greg Kinnear, Renee Zellweger, Jaiman Hansu, and John Voight. Same Kind of Different as Me. I have that on Blu-ray. And El Chicano on Blu-ray as well. And it comes with a digital code. A lot of these come with a digital code, and I'm assuming these digital codes are old by now. Even though they're not used, they're, they're all sealed. So the Gambler has a, has a... Wait, the Gambler has Blu-ray and DVD. Chicano, El Chicano has Blu-ray and digital code. And same kind of different me, same kind of different as me has Blu-ray and digital. Again, I'm assuming the digital codes are 
by now, several years after the fact, are not good, but who knows, maybe they might be good. Now, if you want to actually enter this quote-unquote contest or get one of these Blu-rays, tell me which one you want, and all you got to do is email me at editor at deepestream.com, editor at deepestream.com. I will have all that stuff on the show notes. If you, uh, I won't even mention this on our Cinematics Facebook group. This is one of these things like, if you email me your requests to get one of these discs, I will send them over to you. And the caveat to that is it's a first come, first serve kind of business. So I have three things to give away. First three people to request on my email will get one of these DVDs. Or, or I mean, one of these Blu-rays, I guess. So that's it. So first off will be the review of Cure from Bruce Perky. Thank you to Bruce Perky for that review of Cure, which again, streaming on Criterion Channel and available on Blu-ray. And then the second one for this mini episode will be my interview with high heat filmmaker, Zach Golden. And yeah, I'll, I will also put on the show notes where you can, the just watch links where you can actually get watch some of these movies. As you know, Tampopo and Cure are on the Criterion channel. The first movie of Zach Golden, The Escape of Prisoner 614 or 614, I don't know how you say it, 614, that's currently available. You can actually, I believe, rent, rent it, but it's available on Hoopla as one of the streaming services, and I believe as, as well as Freebie, I believe. Okay, so I know it's on Hoopla. I'm going to stop. I'm going to shut up now. Here is Bruce's review of Cure. And then after that, check out the interview with Zach Golden talking about the Catskills, Olga Kurilenko, and just indie filmmaking. Really good stuff. All right, bye. Thanks, guys. Hey, this is an off-pod review and physical media review of the Criterion release of Kiyoshi Kurosawa's 1970 movie, Cure. I came across Cure originally, I think in the early thousands, which mm, I want to say this probably got released in around 2000 or 2001 in America, probably on an early version of DVD. Uh, and I came across it because I was really getting into kind of that whole big wave of uh, Japanese and South Korean horror at the time. Kiyoshi Kurosawa had released Pulse and Pulse is considered one of the big releases from that time period along with like Ringu and Audition, Juon. So Pulse a lot of times is mentioned as one of the, the biggies of that era. And Cure was his earlier movie. And I wonder, it might have even got released in America because of the popularity of all that stuff. Anyway, this is a little less horror. Uh, we'll go a little bit into what this movie is and why you should be interested in it. For me, if you're looking at like, I don't know, 90s, crime thriller psychological thriller movies for me there's kind of like a holy trinity and if you're looking at those for me that holy trinity would be silence of the lambs seven and cure and cure is the one that probably more people have not encountered and i would guess unless you're really into kind of that era of you know, japanese films especially Japanese horror films, you probably haven't come in contact with Cure. And the reason it probably doesn't get as much talk is because it really isn't a straight ahead horror movie. It's like, like Silence of the Lambs or Seven, kind of horror adjacent. You know, there's horrific elements to it, but it's more of a crime thriller, I guess you'd say. So basic concept of Cure. I will do a spoiler free kind of a mini review here, but I would say if you haven't seen it, definitely try to check this out. You can find it now, of course, on Blu-ray. You could probably find some older DVDs, although I don't know how rare they are. They might be kind of hard to, to get, or they might be kind of expensive. Once again, I haven't really researched that. But if you have the Criterion channel, they also have the uh, version, I think, that's on this Blu-ray is available there. This is, I believe, a transfer from 4K, so I wouldn't be surprised if a 4K comes out in the next few years. Although this is not a hugely hyped movie, so may or may not get that release right away. Basic characters in this movie are Takabe, and that is played by uh, Koji Yakusho. Takabe is a kind of a, I want to say like late 30s, early 40s detective. And it's kind of those world weary detective, as you'll see, you know, in a lot of movies like this. And the other main character in this is Mamiya, and he's played by Masato Hagiwara. And here's the basic setup to this movie. It starts out and there's been a murder. Very common, right? Takagi shows up as a detective. There's been a, a prostitute who's been killed in this room. And she has a big X cut across her throat. It's cut both of her 
carotid and her and her uh, jugular or whatever, you know, it's cut all the veins in her neck and caused her to, to bleed out, of course, on the bed. Uh, kind of this big giant X cut from like one shoulder blade and the other shoulder blade are down across, across her upper chest. The strange thing about the crime scene is they they go in there and they find, uh, you know, supposedly probably the killer's clothing just neatly folded in the bathroom, his wallet's there, it's got his ID and everything. And within a few minutes of them kind of investigating this crime scene and wondering what's going on, they find a man, the same guy that was in the ID, huddled in this little, uh, I don't know, like the storage closet or something in the hallway of this this kind of uh, hourly rental hotel or whatever it was that he was with the prostitute at. You find him just huddled in this little uh, alcove. Not only does he admit that he committed the murder, but he seems very confused and upset about the fact that he committed the murder, and he isn't even sure why he did it, but he did do it, and he knows he did it. And right out of the gate, you find out that this is like the third or fourth of these sorts of murders where somebody commits a murder, they carve this X in the person's throat, chest area. The person who committed the murder doesn't really know why they did it, but they know they did it and they admit freely to doing it. So it's almost like this set of serial killings, but they're all different people that are doing the killings. And that, of course, kind of leads to the basic mystery of this movie. And then the other major event that happens early on in this movie is you meet the other character, the Mamiya character. He's a younger man, probably in his mid-20s, maybe late 20s. And he's just kind of wandering along the beach. He looks like a drifter, kind of a lost and out and alone there. And he meets up with another man who's just sitting on the beach. And then a man on the beach asks him who he is. And this Mamiya character seems very confused, like maybe he has amnesia. Pretty much he can't, he just says, uh, who am I or who are you? And he's got that kind of thing. He just kind of answers with questions. Through this short conversation, you discover that this Mamiya character can't even remember what happened just a few minutes ago. You know, he'll, he'll uh, the guy that's asking Mamiya the questions will say who he is. And then a few seconds later, Mamiya will ask again, well, who are you? So he's obviously not only got like maybe amnesia, but he has short term memory issues as well. He just he seems to be almost just totally a loss at what's going on. And that's your two basic setups for this movie. You have these series of murders all being done by different people with the X being carved. You don't know why. And you have the strange drifter that just shows up and seems to not know who he is. And of course, the two paths are going to eventually cross and how that happens, I'm not going to tell you. And the way this movie plays with uh, memory, uh, with, and I guess, evil, uh, it does some really interesting things that I think have become uh, uh, much more commonplace lately, but I think at the time was very unusual. Uh, movies like It Follows and Smile and some of these sort of movies where murder seems to be some sort of a thing that can be passed along. I'm not going to say exactly the mechanism in this movie because you have discovering that isn't like a huge secret. You probably find out midway through the movie, but part of the discovery of this movie is what is happening. The second part of this movie is way more interesting and psychological. And as the movie goes on, it becomes a little more surreal in some senses philosophical in some senses, but it always maintains that kind of creepy undercurrent. Uh, and once again, the sound design in this movie is super duper interesting. Uh, hardly any music, uh, lots and lots of use of the, the sounds of each of the settings uh, to kind of uh, set the scene and, and set the mood in this movie. Once again, I think it's a highly underrated kind of crime thriller mystery. Something you should look into is Cure 1997. And uh, what about the physical media that we got here? What about this Criterion release? What does it offer uh, above and beyond your normal release? Now, I wouldn't say this is the super, super fancy boutique presentation as far as the packaging. You don't have some crazy slipcover or some really weird box stuff, but it does have some interesting features within here. First of all, the transfer is great, of course. I'm sure this is definitely better than it looked when I originally saw it. The sounds, you know, been all restored, the color and the 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 picture itself is really, really well presented. As well as that, it has a few other things here. Let me go into this for you. First of all, it's got an essay uh, in the slipcover, or not the slipcover, in the um, kind of the liner that's inside. It folds out to a big old essay about this movie and kind of Kurosawa's, once again, it's hard to say Kurosawa because everyone will think of a different Kurosawa, 
So I have to accentuate here, this director is not that Kurosawa, but uh, the less famous Kurosawa. And anyway, uh, essay about this movie and kind of how it plays into that man's uh, kind of filmography. Once again, I haven't seen a bunch of his films, but I have seen Pulse, and Pulse is really good as well. Uh, along with that, we have one well, probably the most interesting thing in here is there is a kind of about a 30 minute conversation between Kurosawa and filmmaker uh, Ryusuke Hamaguchi, who you may know from Drive My Car, uh, which just came out and got a bunch of acclaim, which is a really great movie. Hamaguchi Gucci was uh, one of Kurosawa's students back in college. And uh, it's interesting to see someone who's kind of an acclaimed filmmaker uh, rising up right now and how much love he has for uh, Kiyoshi Kurosawa's work and especially how much love he has for Cure. And they talk really specifically about the process of making this movie, kind of what Kurosawa thought about at the time, because Kurosawa came out of a bunch of like B Yakuza movies right into this movie and all of a sudden was seen in a totally new light. So that I thought was really interesting to listening to that conversation was really good. There's also interviews with the main actors in this movie, which is, which is pretty cool because all of these interviews are pretty recent. So it's kind of a lot of them looking back and kind of seeing how it's affected them and what they thought about it at the time versus what they think now. I think the uh, conversation with Hamaguchi was in like a year or two ago and the actors are talking, I think just about four or five years ago. So still pretty recently. Uh, then there is a little older interview from 2003. So this is probably shortly after the U S release uh, with Kurosawa. So it's interesting to kind of see that interview and what he was thinking about at the time or within like five years of making the movie to what he's thinking about now in this movie. And then there's some trailers and stuff. So not a super packed, crazy extras on this release, but it is well worth, I think, having this in your repertoire because this feels like one of those movies Sure, it may get a 4K release, but this feels like one of those movies because it is still considered, you know, still kind of semi-obscure, not absolutely known even in the film community, that this is one of those things that can go out of print, I can imagine, really quickly, and then just kind of fade away. Like right now, for example, unless you have Criterion, it's not even streaming anywhere. So definitely I would say this is one of those that's worth having a physical copy of some form in your collection somewhere. Anyway, if you like this, obviously go check us out on Cinematics. We talk about brand new movies and a few older movies every single week. Uh, and then on our Find Your Film feed, we will have physical release discussions, maybe some interviews. We'll have um, some off reviews that don't maybe make it to the podcast. So maybe some spoiler discussions. So uh, definitely check out both feeds uh, with the primary one being Cinematics. First of all, you're actually high heat. It feels like three movies rolled into one. That's a that's a compliment. What was the <laughs> biggest challenge? What was the biggest challenge? And actually, you have one locale here, here. You have another story in the parking lot, and then you oh, have yeah. a, a really cool subplot with this dysfunctional yet functional killer family, literally. So, what was highly dysfunctional? <laughs> highly, dis highly dysfunctional. What was the key? And actually, in a way, did you see it as three different stories, or how did you bring them together, or how did you? spend attention to each subset i guess you know well i you know i i it's interesting i sort of the experience of shooting it sort of felt the same way where we only had 15 days to shoot this movie which is like every, every time it comes out of my mouth it doesn't sound real um and i only had six weeks of pre-production i signed on fairly late to the movie to direct it um so the pre-production we you know it was heavily heavily like wake up at five work till midnight every single day i lost nine pounds it was fun <laughs> and the the shoot you know it was like with 15 days it was sort of necessity was the was uh the mother of invention in that and in the sense of we knew we had to be very contained within the restaurant location um and then all of our secondary locations you know with 15 days like you can't afford to do company moves that's just gonna kill your day so we we found a location for the restaurant. We knew that was where sort of the crux of the movie was going to take place. And then we just hit the pavement and started looking around for, for settings that would work for all of those secondary locations. And we happened to find a great parking garage right across the street that had perfect eye lines to the restaurant. Um, then we found, you know, great stuff for the driving. And um, so it was all, all really contained within this one little area of our shoot location. Um, and then in terms of the story, I, I you know, I, I did sort of feel like it was, three stories in one. Um, I felt like the, the through line for all of this stuff was sort of this uh, about emotional honesty and, you know, within a relationship. So 
we have um, obviously Ray and Anna's storyline, which is, you know, kind of Mr. and Mrs. Smith-esque in that they both have a, a secret and that secret is really preventing them from, you know, not, not only taking the next step in their relationship, but like, you know, possibly living, <laughs> possibly making it till tomorrow morning. Um, and then with, with uh, uh, Mimi and Tom, I really felt like that was a great opportunity for some comedy and, um, you know, to sort of play like almost the, the Vince Vaughn role in Mr. and Mrs. Smith to, to go back to that reference. And so, you know, we took a little bit different of an approach that was it was a much more sort of comedic shoot with the two of them where we were really improv and really just trying to find, you know, how can we mine the comedy of this? Because the, the storyline was a little bit more simple than, than Don and Olga's since, you know, they're really they're really the crux of the core of the movie. And then I think with, you know, with all the other characters, I'm, I'm not sure who you would delineate as like the third, the third movie, but for me, it was Dom and Mick, Diamond Dallas Page, yeah. uh, childhood hero of mine and current hero of mine. And, uh, and Ivan Martin, who is like, Ivan Martin played Mick and man, I just thought the first day we had him on set was our first day with Don Johnson. And we did, I think their first, I think the first scene with the both of them was together. And like, I, Ivan bought me so much goodwill with Don. Don pulled me aside right after we shot the first take. He goes, this guy, this, you got to get more of this guy in the movie. And, and we did, we were literally just like, how can we get more Ivan in here? Can we let's, okay, let's write this scene. Let's get him like rocking out in his car after his dad sends him to time out. So yeah, it, it really felt kind of like three movies and the way we shot it really made it feel like that. You have 15 days to shoot during the production. You could have, if you wanted as a director, make the actions very quick, cutty, violent, finished, but you didn't do that <laughs> even though you had 15 days how the heck were you able to pull that off especially the sequence i'm thinking with the one with caitlin and olga towards the third act and and then you even have a, s- a situation where they're she's trying to smoke them out and they're uh, sort of around the corner of the building you don't you, you're making these action sequences elaborate within a confined space with a confined set of days how were you able to do that that that, that was pretty amazing i thought yeah. yeah i mean it's like two things it's preparation and a great team honestly i know that's like it's a bit of a cop-out answer but um so preparation like you know in that six weeks of pre-pro in addition to you know getting the script where where we wanted it to be to fit the casting and casting the show and hiring everyone and you know finding locations and all that i had the benefit of working with uh adam lee who's been my cinematographer for like 12 years um so you know he and i have like a, a very we know what each other is thinking without having to say it. And then I also brought on um, Kelsey Taylor, who's a a super talented director in her own right. And I asked her to be my second unit director so that I could have, while I was shooting scene work, she could be working with the actors and with Drew Leary, our incredible stunt coordinator, to really just like, you know, every minute of downtime, if I was shooting something with Chris and Caitlin, Olga and Don could be learning the beats to uh, the fight choreography. So, you know, like going into it, I knew when I, as soon as I read the script, I, I love this genre of movie. So I knew very much that I didn't want, you know, kick, kick, punch, cut. I wanted it to feel alive and I wanted it to feel energetic and zippy. And obviously like our schedule is very much working against us in that, uh, in that regard. But, you know, like I can't say enough good things about Drew Leary. I can't say enough good things about the crew. Like a 15, a movie like this doesn't happen in 15 days without everyone being a superhero it's you know it was like it's hard it's it's hard as you know as a director to demand that much of people to to say you know not a real not only are we going to shoot six or seven pages today but we're also going to shoot like this crazy you know this crazy fight scene that has 25 shots um and you know we're going to have to run it many 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 times and our poor stunt people (laughs) there's a bit of a contest by the end of the movie where the it's small so like our stunt team was small it was four or five guys um, and and one lady and and they were counting how many times we killed them in the movie. So I think Seth Andrews, if I'm not mistaken, won. He was the one we lit on fire, and I believe we we killed him something like 15 or 16 times. So it, you know, it's just it was it was a real challenge, but it was probably the most gratifying part for me was be you know going and really busting everyone's butt, my myself and my whole team. And um, you know, when you get the rushes and you can see the dailies seeing, oh, wow, this like, this might, Atomic Blonde might have taken 25 days to shoot this and we did it in four and a half hours, but you know, like it works. It's cool. That's so awesome. You know, my mom is, is the biggest cinephile I know, and she's very picky on what she sees as far as modern day cinema. And I said, mom, you got to see High Heat. I really enjoyed it. And she goes, ah, you know, the new movies, I can't, I don't know about it. And she's saying, no, no, no. And then I just mentioned two words, Olga Kurlenko. And she says, oh yeah, I love her. Got to see it. <laughs> 
how awesome is it for you to have Olga really spearheading your production on as as a lead? Because for there's a lot of people who will just watch a movie, you know, your, the quality, the production, the standing, just because yeah. of her. So that must be a huge bonus for you. Totally, and, and count me amongst one of those people who'd watch it just because she's in it. I mean, like she's worked with you know Terry Malick and Martin McDonough, some of my absolute heroes of directing. And I was very intimidated to work with her. I mean, she's this like you know very beautiful uh, Ukrainian woman who like every time I see her on on screen in the last few years, she's beating the crap out of a dude who's way tougher looking than I am. I thought she was amazing. I mean, the fact that she was able to bring such like a, such a emotion and and realness to that character. So that it didn't feel cartoony, you know, aside from the action. Um, but then, you know, we'd, okay, cool. Now we're going to go beat up five guys. The fact that she's able to do both. I mean, she's like a real life superhero. It's, it doesn't make any sense. And actually we, um, our first day shooting, we were shooting just, you know, we gave ourselves a really easy first day so we could all sort of figure out how do, how we like to work with each other. And we were just going to shoot a little couple pieces of a fight scene and then sub her in for Taylor Lupini, who was her stunt double on the film. And Taylor's wig didn't match Olga's hair. Like we, we, we got the first shot set up and I was like, oh no, I, guys, I hate to do it, but this is never gonna, this is never gonna work. It's like, you know, we're gonna go from white hair to blonde hair. And uh, so our, our makeup, hair and makeup team was awesome. And they jumped on it as quick as they could. And we said, okay, well, let's, let's throw Olga in there. Let's see what she's capable of. And we ended up shooting the entire scene with Olga. And it was the, it was the scene where she attacked those four guys and stuffed them in the walk-in. And, you know, that was day one. So it kind of gave us a template for what we could do moving forward. It was like, okay, there's really nothing that she's not capable of. And um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was such a, an extreme honor to, to work with her and to, you know, I think like with her and Don and, and really the whole cast, cause we got a, a pretty amazing cast for a movie of this, of this scale. It's, you know, it's, it, I'm super grateful, like the generosity of those people to, to lend their name and their experience and their, their talents to, to a small indie production. It opens it up to an audience that, you know, these films don't often get to get to be exposed to. So it's, you know, it's uh, nothing but love for everyone on that. So like I went to your personal website and the only memory I have of the Catskills was my, <laughs> my uh, aunt and uncle who lived, I believe in Jackson Heights. I just remembered the drive to the Catskills took forever but and we stayed at some kind of hotel and it was beautiful out i've never seen so many trees in my life yeah. just I, I know that's one of the places you live in or i don't know how long you were that you've lived there or maybe you lived there in the past what was the advantage for you as an artist living in that environment what is it like uh, just for someone who's ignorant like me sure well i i uh, lived in new york city for 10 years i went to nyu so from the time i went to school to to the time i moved up here i moved up to the catskills in 2014 full-time um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I grew up in the, I grew up in Western New York, but my parents were children's camp directors. So I really spent a lot of my time in the Adirondacks up in the mountains. So this to me very much felt like sort of returning home in a way I live on the side of a mountain. I live, like you said, like there's, my view is just trees. <laughs> um, and as an artist, I find it like extremely inspiring. Uh, I feel that it actually like my surroundings really help inform what I'm writing and what I'm working on. And you know, sort of how my brain puts stories together. And I found that since I moved up here, I've just sort of like really these finding stories of like, you know, people versus nature. And that's been sort of a constant theme of, in my writing, um, you know, aside from this, obviously. So yeah, I think it's it's awesome. And, you know, I, I love it. I just, I love being outside. I have two dogs, so I'm able to take them for long walks and not have them on leashes. It's like, you know, I could have found a bigger counterpoint to New York City. Right off the top of your head, can you name one of your all-time favorite movies? And what is it about this specific movie that resonates with you? Oh, sure. Well, I'll, I'll give you, that's a hard question, I'm sure, as you know. Uh, but I'll give you one that, that really spoke to me for this movie, and that was Tom Popo. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. And, you know, it's like, for, for those who aren't aware of it, it's kind of a spaghetti western but instead of you know having a bad guy hunting down the bad guy or you know having to save the save the niece or whatever it's uh, opening a, a ramen restaurant and i thought what it did so beautifully and why it spoke to me so much was it really bridges that feeling between food and emotion and how you know eating and sharing food and cooking is such a is such a communal experience and such a social experience you know you give of yourself when you cook for someone and like i don't know about you but personally like the thing i look forward to most more than anything else is eating <laughs> so i just thought like i brought i, I watched that a ton of times in the run-up to, to shooting this just in terms of like you know wanting to always find that perfect image of food and really have like food be a, a way to see inside a character 
So I think that's a that's a, a super great movie. Uh, everyone should check it out. It's on Criterion. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> Zach, so for the people who actually watch High Heat and they go, I, I want to see his previous film. So what what can people expect from the previous film pre High Heat? And you're talking about, about the bridge. Can one, even though they're different genres, can yeah. can there be some sort of subtle bridge between the two? If not, what are what can people who are really liking your work expect from you down the road as far as things you're passionate about on a cinematic level yeah sure um well i do think there's like there's definitely some connective tissue between escape of prisoner 614 and high heat uh, it's you know very different genres prisoner 614 is like a very sort of sleepy small town movie that really was you know a very sort of focused storyline on these two characters um but i think like the the through line that i see between them is just sort of i try to infuse like a some humor and humanism into everything i do like i would say hal ashby is probably my favorite director and I just think that there's so much doom and gloom out there. There's, you know, I mean, the world is is full of it. You don't have to look too far that when I like when I go to the cinema, when I watch a movie, I want to feel good about it. I want to feel good about my life. I want to feel good about the world. And I think humor is a really great way to do that. Like, obviously, High Heat has some some dark subject matter, but there's some levity to it that that sort of, you know, lets you see the lighter side of life. And so. I think that's something that like I definitely want to continue going forward. Um I you know I'm I'm always writing. I I'm very like I can't sit still. So I'm always if I'm not writing a script, I'm developing one to write. And I think it's not always straight comedy, but I always try to take that sort of Hal Ashby attitude of, you know, finding the finding the levity and finding like this this sort of uh optimistic look of humanity. And as you're leaving, is that why, even with all the tragic stuff that he actually faced as a director, is that why Hal Ashby is your favorite filmmaker? Because he was able to mix the humor amidst all the, the tragedy that, that goes on within his stories? Yeah, absolutely. I just think he like he had such a keen, observant eye on what it means to be a human. And, you know, what it means to be a human is not just the good times or the bad times. It's, you know, it's like a delicious cornucopia of both and uh, and being able to sort of find the find the light in that darkness is, you know, few, few have done it better than he has. Zach, thank you for, so much for your time. I really enjoyed High Heat. L- really looking forward to seeing your previous film as well. So, you know, oh. looking forward to talking to you as well too down the road. All right. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it.